Hello, everybody, and welcome to this exciting, exciting video where I'm going to say some blasphemous things. There's, there's quite a few ways to talk about this, and I don't know exactly how to start this off other than just saying that over the years, and you will hear Bukowski talk about this as well, there have been a lot of poets to come up who were really trying to imitate Bukowski and trying to like be the next Bukowski and do all of this stuff. Um, he, he would write stories of people showing up saying, Oh dude, you'll love my stuff. You know, like just like, let me come read my stuff to you. You'll love it. We're the same and all this shit. And it drove him fucking crazy then. Since he's been dead, I don't really know. I wasn't really in the poetry scene in the 90s. But there might have been a bit of a resurgence a little bit. But I think in the early 2000s, there were probably a lot more people who had discovered him who were trying to be more like him. Now, I want to say right off the bat that I think the fact that people want to be more like him, it, it shows his greatness. Now, it is, for some reason, super fucking taboo to even like Bukowski in the poetry world, okay? But you can't deny the, the impact he had. He was probably the most prolific poet probably ever. He was probably making more money with his poetry than any other poet of that time period. And then if you just go into his celebrity, the fact that his books of short story were selling, his novels were selling, his um, collection of articles were being sold. The movie Barfly was made, you know, like, um, and there were many other movies made on his stuff in other countries that he got paid for. Plus all of his translation deals, um, he did very well with his art. Now, it doesn't really sound like I'm making that strong of a case right now for why one shouldn't want to be but there, there is a very, very strong fucking case. So I want to start this out by explaining that the people who I feel, the people who I have talked to, who are like, yeah, dude, like, Bukowski was the best. I want to be like Bukowski. And it's, it's weird because people usually don't come out and go, I want to be like Bukowski. But they idolize him so much and then will kind of get a little glimmer in their eye when they talk about certain things about him. And for the people who fucking hate Bukowski, this drives them crazy more than anything. And there's a part of me that wonders if Bukowski would have been accepted more now after his death if there weren't so many fucking people who were trying to be him. Like, I, I think the fact that there are so many people who, like, imitate Bukowski, that it makes the poetry world, like, fucking fangs out. Like, we are ready to go, motherfucker. How dare you? But I want to um, kind of talk about the Bukowski myth and kind of make it clear to some level what, if you really want to be Bukowski and be like Bukowski, what that means your life would be like. Because I don't think people fucking understand this. Okay, let's start from the fucking beginning, okay? So if we look at the novels that um, Bukowski wrote, the Chinaski novels, we can kind of judge time periods, okay? So, Ham on Rye, not a whole lot went down as far as, like, 
his career and all this shit. So that takes us from his birth in 1920 to Pearl Harbor being bombed in 1941. Okay? That's Hamon Rye. The next book, Factotum, which again, I think if they would have changed the title of this book to The Ten Year Drunk, this probably would have been his highest selling book. Because that falls in line with his myth. So, if you're listening out there and you want to sell some copies of that book, do that. Because I think that title, I understand why he called it that, but that's a horrific title. Especially the farther and farther we get away from fucking 1930. So, Factotum takes us from 1942 to 1952. There are a couple things that happened during this time, but this is when he was kind of, he wasn't in school. He was kind of trying to find himself, going across country, um, just trying to explore. And a lot of people do this when they are of this age. They don't want to be in the place where they grew up. They finally have wings a bit to be able to go out and go to a different place, go to a different state, go to a different city, and check everything out. And usually, anyone who does this ends up right back where the fuck they were within a couple years. But whatever. So during this time, um, he was writing a little bit here and there. And if you listen to him, he was constantly handwriting stories and sending them out. Well, in 1944... When he was 24, he got um, his first story published in Story Magazine. And it was um, Aftermath of a Lengthy Rejection Slip. Then two years later, he was published in Portfolio. Like, he had a couple broadsides in Portfolio. And that was basically the 40s. Okay? Okay. So, Post Office. The Book of Post Office basically takes place from 1952 to 1970. Okay? That's a big chunk. Alright? The book doesn't seem like that much time had passed. But that's what happened here. Because from 1952 to 1955, he was a mail carrier. Then... Um, In 1955-ish, he quit the post office to um, be a fucking gambler. He was going to follow the horses and shit, okay? And during this time, he ended up meeting Barbara Fry, marrying Barbara Fry, um, moving to Texas for a short period of time before coming back. Now... With Barbara Fry in the picture now, we know that he had some poems published. He had poems published in Matrix in the 50s, um, Nomad in the late 50s, I believe, and Harlequin, which was Barbara Fry's uh, little magazine, which is how they ended up meeting. I just said that. And then he became the editor of this little magazine for a period of time and all this other shit. And then, um, I can't remember if they split, and then he went back to the post office. I think that's what happened. I think they split, and then he ended up back at the post office. So now, at the post office, as a clerk, he works here for 12 years. Okay? Now, during this time, he's still writing, but every night, he's fucking at the post office. Whenever the horses are running, he's down at the track. Okay? So, he is riding, playing the horses, going to work. Okay? A lot of time he spent doing this stuff, there, there isn't as much time for him to live the wild life that you think there is. So, for instance, when he wasn't writing poems or stories, he was writing letters. Okay? This right here, these books, these are the letters he wrote. 
And these aren't even all of them. These are just the ones that people still had copies of. Look at this. Letters. Okay? So this motherfucker sat at home when he wasn't at the track or wasn't at work, and he just typed. And I know a thing about sending drunk emails. So I know how this goes. Like, in 1960, Flower Fist and Bestial Will came out. Um, by the mid-60s, he was doing the books with Lujan Press. Um, by the late, mid to late 60s, I would probably say closer to 67 or 68, he was writing the articles for Open City. Now, if you know about Bukowski's work, you know there are a few stories of what went on during Open City and all this other stuff. But what you got to think about, that, ma that newspaper only lasted like two years. Like maybe a little bit before two years or a little after, but either way. The other thing you have to know about Bukowski is that if anything interesting ever fucking closely remotely happened, he would fucking write about it. And he would write a poem about it, he'd write a short story about it, and it would end up in one of his novels. That's usually how the things went. Just judging by that, there's probably three, maybe four stories about that time period with the Open City stuff. Okay? And those would probably span five or six days if you add them all up. Because the other thing you see in those stories and in those poems is that they don't want him around, but they want his work. And then he doesn't want to hang around with them because they're a bunch of hippy dippies and um, all this other shit. So he he's like constantly blowing these fucking people off. Okay? So this wild life that he's living is still post office, racetrack, typing at home. Okay? So now that he finally quits the racetrack in 1970... And we start with the fourth Chinaski book, Women. This book takes place roughly from 1970 to 1976, maybe 77. This book has a little over 100 chapters, which seems like a lot. But over six or seven years, is that really that much? And then considering two and a half years of that, he was with Linda King... And he wrote a bunch of crazy shit that she did over all that time. What the fuck was happening? That's a lot of time to be fucking either bored, just by yourself drunk, or writing. Because remember, if anything interesting ever fucking happened, he would write about it. There are so many stories and letters even, that he's written where people are pissed off at him for writing about everything that fucking happens. And there's that great story, too, where the chick's like, you can't write a love story, you're not a writer, and all this other shit, and, um, and you and your fucking beer. You know, oh, oh, Harry sits down and he takes a sip of beer. Ooh, and, like, the whole fucking thing. And then he just repeats a story of that she told him when she got there and then he's like and Harry took a sip of beer ah, feels great to be writing again you know like everything he did he fucking put in his shit if it was fucking worth a damn on top of that a lot of his stories especially the um, Tales of Ordinary Madness the erection stories erections ejaculations and tales of ordinary madness and shit like that. A lot of those stories were told to him from other people. So like Red Strange is like a lot of those stories that make Bukowski look like a psychopath weren't Bukowski at all. It was his fucking batshit crazy friend Red. So a lot of this like built up mythos was him just taking the best stories from the people that he knew. Okay. And so now um, he's super famous fucking poet guy, sort of. Um, and we get into the book Hollywood. 
And if you've ever read Hollywood, it is like, it seems to just like go at a fucking nice pace, okay? But what a lot of people don't know, I don't think, is that this book is basically nine years of stuff that happened. So from like 1977 to 1986 is this book. That's a lot of days. You know, I mean, there's at least fucking 365 days in a year. Nine years, that's a lot of fucking days. So if you think about all this shit, his life was not that exciting at all. Because if you could seriously just be like, oh, well, fuck. I don't know, I had five good days this year. That's basically it. You know what I'm saying? So what the thesis of my little story here is. If we take the years where he was living as a professional writer. Okay. That's the amount of work we have from him is basically 1970 to 1990. I know he put other stuff out after that, but um, after the late 80s, he was starting to get really ill a lot. So, like, let's not fuck with that. But even if you wanted to throw in a few of those years before from the 60s where his um, cult status started to rise, you know, like, okay, if we put that, we have 30 years we're talking about here. 30 fucking years. Out of that 30 year period, 30 fucking years, okay? The amount of stories that he has that are actually things that happened to him, if you add all of those things up, it might, might be two or three years worth of stuff. If you are being fucking generous is shit, five. Because I'm assuming being with Linda King for two and a half years would fucking fuck up anyone's goddamn fucking thing. So, 30 fucking years. And if we're being fucking generous, let's say how it was. That means 15 years of that time, at least... Well, if we're going 30 years, then it would be more like 25. So 25 years, you're doing nothing. You're sitting at home, maybe by yourself, maybe not, but you're miserable, you're drinking, and you are writing angry letters to people and writing. Now, if that sounds like a wonderful life, then do that. Because that's building a body of work. But people usually don't idolize Bukowski for him writing every night. They idolize Bukowski for all of the extra shit that happened. The myth of Bukowski. Which he built up a lot himself. Do you guys see what I'm saying here? Like, his life obviously was not glamorous. But even knowing his life wasn't glamorous, it wasn't even as fun or exciting as the life that people think he had. Um, a couple other things here. One thing that is probably completely lost forever now and will never come back is the way in a lot of his stories and a lot of his work where there are constantly people just showing up and um, wanting to get fucked up with them and wanting to ask him for shit and wanting to show them his poems and all this other fucking crap. I don't know if this can happen like this anymore. And the way I'm going to describe it is, is this. like, First, we have the internet now. So because we have the internet now, people don't go out as much as they used to. Whether it's because you could watch movies at home, stream them. Whether it's because you can talk to your friends online or play games or whatever. 
let's just say it was that. Back then, there weren't, like, and this is mainly the 70s this was going on. There weren't video stores even. There wasn't Redbox. You couldn't even fucking go rent a movie. Oh, and this is something that a lot of younger people don't even fucking understand. There was a time when there was a thing called long distance. And if you called somebody that was farther than like 20 minutes from you, it would cost you money. And the farther they were away, the more it would cost per minute. And you guys are like, what the fuck? And just so you know, too, when cell phones started, they tried doing that shit, too. Can you imagine? You guys talk to motherfuckers from all over the place. Doesn't cost you a goddamn thing. Except your soul to a fucking goddamn cell phone provider. <clears throat> anyway, that's besides the point. This isn't turned into some fucking political bullshit argument. So now what I want you to think about, I want you to close your eyes and think about all the friends you have online on all your social media shit, all those friends, you know, you got tons of people, hundreds, hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people who follow you and all this shit. Now close your eyes and think of the people who, out of those people, how many of those people live within 10 minutes of you, 20 minutes of you, okay? Those would be all your friends. Those would be the people who would be coming to see you every night. If the internet didn't exist. So now, with that being said, you should be horribly fucking depressed because you've just realized that you have no friends and you barely have a life. Okay? So, with that said, I don't think it is possible, even if you wanted to be like Bukowski... I don't think it's possible to have the life, even the mythological life that Bukowski had. I, I don't think it's fucking humanly possible now. Another thing, I fucking have made more money with my poetry probably in the last month that Bukowski made all the way up it through till 1970. Actually, I will go further. I know that I even made more than he made through his first couple months with Black Sparrow. So, but then this motherfucker starts getting checks for like $3,000, $4,000, $10,000, and I can't compete with that yet, so that's fine. But what I'm saying is I'm doing better than he was doing when the myth was happening, okay? You are probably doing better with your art, with your poetry, with your writing, than he was at this time. Adjusted for inflation. That is shocking. Do you understand this? Like, I, I fucking love Bukowski. I really fucking do. I think his work fucking changed the fucking game. And I think his work stands up to anybody's work. But the, the fucking hero worship that comes from the Bukowski myth is very much unjustified. You have probably lived a more interesting life than Bukowski has. You just don't know how to fucking sizzle it up when you write it down. He was really fucking good at that. You just add a bit of panache, you know? A little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. So, if this video does anything for you, I just want you to know that I think it's perfectly fine to fucking admire the writing of a fucking legend. But... That's where it should probably end, guys. Like, don't, like, go hard on wanting to be Bukowski. That's it. So, with that said, um, Los Angeles is out now. Um, preview of Dangerous Minds out now. On my Etsy shop. Um, end of everything. And uh, Fingering the Mundane are available on Amazon. 
as with all my other fucking books of fiction and shit like that. Um, Blood Rag issue four is out now, and since it's still October, hell, let's look at some thirteen miles south of hell um, horror poetry. So that was a long ass fucking video. I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do with this. So with that being said, um, keep buying my books. Type hard, everybody, and I will see you later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys, and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.